Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is Carla Mantia. She's the author of Gender Trolling, How Misogyny Went Viral, 2015. She's a longtime editor and collective member of Off Our Backs journal, News Journal. She has taught at Gettysburg College, University of Maryland, George Mason University, and McDaniel College. So first, thank you for your work in the world, and second, thank you for being on the program. Hey, thank you so much for this opportunity. It means a lot. So let's talk about um, the bullying or the, the harassment of women on the Internet and the differences between that and harassment in real life. Okay, so I think actually it's important to see the harassment of women on the Internet as a continuation and kind of another iteration of harassment in real life. Um, the kind of the ultimate goal of harassment of women on the Internet is silencing of women, and there's a long history of silencing of women in public platforms, um, and that has gone on for a long time. All kinds of women have been silenced, and uh, there have been women who've been there where they've been speaking burned down, things thrown at them, attacked physically. Um, so the, what's happening on the Internet is similar. The thing that I, the distinction I want to make in my book is that what I call gender trolling, and I just call it that because there needs to be a name for it, is very different from generic trolling. Generic trolling is more kind of people do it to kind of what they call the lols, L-O-L-S. Um, so it's, or L U. L-S-Z, actually, is how they spell it in the among trolls. But um, that's done more kind of for laughs. But uh, what I call gender trolling is a unique thing that mostly happens to women. It occasionally happens to other people, to men or to other, you know, people of color along that axis. But mostly it happens to women, and it's much more virulent than other kinds of trolling. Um, the reason why I wanted to make a point about this is that Certain things have happened to women that we've needed to come up with names for. For example, date rape, domestic violence, stalking, street harassment. These are all things that have happened to women that we had to conceptualize as these are unique kind of tools that uh, oppression, uh, patriarchy uses against women. So I just came up with this name of gender trolling, and I've given it um, actually has seven different characteristics that distinguish it from generic trolling. The first one is that it's in response to women being outspoken on the Internet. Um, and so it could be any topic. It could be women talking about breastfeeding, biking, sustainable housing. A professor of classics at Cambridge was gender trolled. Um, Ashley Judd, because she was talking about a basketball game play. Um, some women who were trying to get the, a woman's face on a British banknote. The topics are completely, uh, absolutely diverse but it happens to women who speak out, and that's a key aspect. The second one is that it involves graphic, sexualized, and gender-based insults. That tends to be unique because that's one way particularly women are targeted, obviously both offline, not just in terms of insults, but in terms of actual rape. But online, there's pornographic imagery is made of women. I just read today in the Washington Post that there's a new kind of uh, thing called uh, involuntary synthetic pornography, where they're actually able to graft women's heads onto pornographic movies and videos much more effectively, and so it looks like the, they're showing a video of a woman participating in pornography, even though it's uh, completely um, made up. The third characteristic is rape and death threats, often credible ones that involve a time and place so, for example, I know where you live, It's and they would say the address, I'm going to come to your house Tuesday at 10 a.m. and rape and kill you. That's Those are illegal, but they're not taken seriously. However, they're very common. The rape and death threats are probably the most common characteristic, and they happen a lot. Um, that includes doxing, which is where the woman's address and personal information is publicized so that it's, a lot of people are kind of uh, made available, that information. The fourth characteristic is that such gender trolling, again, different from generic trolling, is it crosses online platforms. So, for example, it's pervasive. So if it starts on Twitter, it'll go to Tumblr, to Instagram, Facebook, blogs. There'll be sock puppet blogs written as though in the woman's voice. Storify, uh, they find her email accounts, YouTube, 
They will find her phone number, send her texts, Wikipedia, Reddit. It just crosses all kinds of online platforms, and so it's very pervasive. The fifth characteristic is its unusual intensity and frequency. Women report up to 500 harassing messages per day across various forms of media. So it's it's an onslaught. The sixth characteristic is it happens for a long period of time. Most instances of trolling are like, you know, a few weeks to a month. I've talked to women who it's been over five years they've been trolled, gender trolled, just relentless attacks. And then the last characteristic, which I think enables all these others, is that it's it's uh, these attacks are carried out by many, many attackers in what's called the manosphere, which is parts of the Internet where very sexist men gather together, um, 8chan, 4chan, some sections of Reddit, and a bunch of other places. And so it's a group action. It's not just one person. It's sometimes thousands of men participate in this against a particular targeted woman. So it's it's something that women are not, a lot of people are not aware is happening. So when it happens to each individual woman, she feels just like, oh, my God, why is this happening to me? And I think it's really important for us to see this as this is something that happens to women a lot. And to find out we need to obviously change uh, laws and structures and uh, accommodate ourselves to the fact that this is happening, find ways to challenge it. And also to seek solidarity among other women to know that it's obviously not personal. So that's a brief brief story about what 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 I've been uh, hearing about. So you you sort of answered this, but I, I want to ask it again specifically. What's the scale of this 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 problem? Is is it again? You sort of answered this, but can you go a little bit more into? Is this something that happens to? A few women sometimes, or is this something that is almost ubiquitous, or where is it in between? So it's really hard to know because there's no way to, like, gather data or do some kind of survey or any kind of statistically accurate um, data gathering about what's happening on the Internet. When I started to uh, notice the phenomenon, uh, probably it was in 2013 or 2014, I just knew some women to whom it had happened. And as I started writing the book, it just became like I interviewed many women and I just read thousands and thousands of stories. Um, I can't tell you how often, how much it happens. Certainly I can't give a percentage or any, anything like that, but it is, it's, it's very common. It's common enough that, I mean, it, if you like Google about women being harassed, it's, there's websites devoted to trying to, to deal with the ramifications of it. Um, it's certainly very scary. A lot of women have uh, silenced themselves from dealing with it. It's happened to famous women as well. And so I think that that has had a kind of a quelling or silencing effect for other women who've seen that that's happened. Um, for example, one of the members of parliament in England, it happened to her. The chief editor for Time magazine in England also was involved in this. And those women received bomb threats, real, uh, like very credible bomb threats. So other women can see that, and so it has that kind of a silencing effect. It's prevalent enough to have an effect on women who are on the Internet. That's what I would say. So this is this is purely anecdotal, but almost every woman, almost every woman that I know has, has received this, and certainly every feminist I know has yeah. received this. Yes. Yeah, I do think it is ultimately an anti-feminist thing and it certainly is ha that's part of women speaking out has always been a feminist uh, issue for women to speak out on any topic so if feminist women are um have it happen more i definitely some of the women i interviewed or, or read about would say that they would really try to avoid feminist topics because they felt that that would be a kind of result in more of this kind of uh, being attacked and targeted so there's there's two directions I want to go, and you, you can go either one or both. And one of them is just today, coincidentally, a friend of mine wrote to me to say that she her family used to be live close to the California Supreme Court Justice Rose Bird. And again, this person did not know I was interviewing you today about this, but just coincidentally wrote to me to say 
that um, Rose Bird used to get so much hate mail from men that uh, she often would ask her neighbor to like pick up her mail for her and sort of go through to take out the the, the, the rape and death threats. And second, that there were so many men hanging outside her house oh my God. that she would often go to a friend's house to stay for a while just because she got sick of all the, the men outside. And okay, so before we go to my next question, do you want do you, I mean that that seems to be that's in person as opposed to on the internet, but that seems to be similar to what we're talking about. Well, what's really important is to know that this kind of thing that happens on the internet does not stay on the internet. Um, so women have been attacked in real life. Um, there was one, a woman law student, Jill Filipovic, who she wasn't actually attacked, but one of the trolls who was harassing her online came to her office one night when she was in law school, and she was alone, and she barely made it out. It was a very difficult confrontation. Um, another woman who um, had been putting some feminist stuff online, um, she got some letters left at her doorstep saying that someone was going to come kill her mother and her. Other people have posted, I saw you in the grocery store in a red sweater. I'm going to come kill you. So these kinds of things don't stay online, especially when you're dealing with the hordes of men. They can coordinate, and when they find a woman's address, they can find some man who lives in that area who could go after her in person for sure. Also, there have been credible rape and death that's made against several of the women in Gamergate and other women, Enough that those women actually fled their homes and stayed on, one of them stayed on couches with friends for months, another one moved, several women have moved because of the credible threats that they've received from online behavior. And this is really important and something law enforcement doesn't take seriously. They tend to scoff at women and say, well, just turn off your computer, as though turning off your computer would stop men from actually coming in person and threatening and harassing and frightening women. And, you know, we live in a rape culture, so these things are not, you know, you add that background to it, women are, of course, terrified. Apart from which, those cops are also then suggesting that the women silence themselves, which is the whole point, which is one of the points of the harassment in the first place. Exactly. And as many, many women point out, the Internet is essential for women, many women in careers, especially journalists such as Megan Murphy and other women who have been shut off the Internet because of this kind of harassment. So... You you did this some, but can you can you talk more explicitly about the the, <laughs> the history of patriarchy? The reason I'm I'm laughing is because I was going to ask you to talk about the silencing of women through through the ages, but of course the silencing of women is the history of patriarchy as well. Oh, that's yeah, that's true. Well, so the earliest uh, written att- record of a man silencing attempting to silence a woman was in Homer's Odyssey. Uh, this has been discussed by Mary Beard, the professor of classics at the University of Cambridge, who was also gender trolled quite heavily herself. I was going to say, for, for which she certainly got attacked, I'm sure. She absolutely. And she, she got attacked, and actually not for that, but for appearing on a television show about immigration. And she was virulently attacked for that. At any rate, so this was 800 BCE when her, the Odyssey was written. And in it, uh, Penelope, one of the characters, comes down to... Uh, request that someone sing a different song, and her son rebuked, re- rebuked her and told her this speech is the business of only men, basically. Um, and then in, the, in this country in 1828, Frances White was the first woman to lecture to a, in a public venue. Uh, she was attacked virulently at that, uh, and she had to, there was a fire, actually. Someone set fire to a barrel of turpentine, and she and the audience fled at that point. So this, it's, I mean, I could just recount over and over so many things uh, that have happened throughout history where women have been silenced from public venues. And the interesting thing is the Internet is now a public venue. It's our public venue for speech. And so it's kind of what has moved from, from you know, the physical realm into the, into the virtual realm. However, Anita Sarkeesian, one of the women from Gamergate, has had to shut down Several of her speeches have been canceled because of very credible death threats made against people said they were men said they were going to come with guns and shoot up the audience. And she had no choice but to cancel the events. Why in 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 countries that that uh, have an ostensible 
that ostensibly value free speech, why is this so common and why is this allowed? And why is this in some ways encouraged, frankly? You know, that's so interesting because, yeah, they, they're, and actually a lot of the men in, in the manosphere are very big free speech advocates in their minds. And so they are, it's a very confusing kind of thinking where they, some men, so a woman says something, a man screams horrible invective and death threats and rape threats, and they think that that's the part that's free speech. And they don't see that threatening violence shuts down speech. They, they are so, and the other problem is too that they're very absolutist because in fact, free speech is limited in this country. We, you're not free, uh, credible threats are, credible death threats are, uh, in violation of the law. And that's not enforced primarily because law enforcement doesn't take them seriously. And also there's other issues too because the juris- there's jurisdiction issues in terms of if someone made the threat in Ohio and you're in, in Pennsylvania, who has jurisdiction? Which, which police force takes care of that? And they haven't dealt with that. We, we need to update our laws to reflect online activities. But the, um, oh, my mind just went blank. We were talking about, um, the, oh, real rape and death threats, um, are, are illegal. So that's an important facet too. So, What's the, do do you, I'm not trying to drive a wedge here, I'm honestly, I'm honestly curious. Do you see this in, after the American Civil War, when, after slavery had been outlawed, then the, the threats against, lynching went up after the American Civil War, um, because, because white, white people were no longer, white men, white people were no longer uh, had legal access to the lives and labor of African Americans, and their entitlement was threatened. And there's this great line by, I can't stand Nietzsche, but he has a great line here, of one does not hate when one can despise. So long as one's sense of entitlement isn't threatened, um, one does not need to resort to, to death threats, because it's just the way things go. And there's a great line, and Judith Herman told me a great line in... Um, the battered women's movement, which is one good beating lasts a year, which is you only have to use so much violence or threats of violence in order to maintain your supremacy, maintain your position of entitlement. And so I'm wondering, is a lot of what we're seeing, in addition to the anonymity of the Internet and everything else, is a lot of this a backlash against the great strides that women have made in terms of women's liberation, um, you know, the, the right to legalized abortion, the acknowledgement that date rape exists, which, you know, the acknowledgement didn't exist so much so earlier. So is this a backlash, do you believe? I absolutely believe so. And the, one of the reasons I think so is because if you look at what the manosphere is constituted by, it's men's rights activists who are groups of men. There are different kind of strands. But many of them have something in common, and that is that they have been unable to find a girlfriend or a partner. Um, so there's all kinds of – obviously, we've heard about incels because of some of the recent murders by those men of women, random women, um, Elliot Roger and uh, Alex Manassian in Canada. There's also uh, – there's a whole groups of men that I think are very bitter because women have a little bit more choice about whether or not to be with a man now. You know, a hundred years ago, you kind of had, as you're a woman, you didn't have a lot of options. But now women can earn less than men, but still enough that they can have some independence. Control over reproduction is key to that. Um, not having a lot of, if you have a lot of children, you're obviously stuck with who, whatever man you uh, may have partnered up with. So the men are are not as able to find partners. And throughout, you know, for many men. Having a partner is having a subordinate who, who they can kind of kick around either physically or metaphorically. So they're bitter. And it's, years ago, I remember right after Elliot Rogers shot up the, um, people in, uh, this California, Southern California, I was talking with a man and I was, I was saying to him, I don't understand why someone gets angry when they're rejected sexually. I just feel hurt. And he looked at me and he was like, Oh, I feel angry, and I thought, 
oh, that's weird. And I think that reflects what you're talking about. There's a sense of entitlement to women, to women's bodies, to women's labor and service in the home that men have felt. And they're reacting against the fact that they're no longer entitled to it. So they're angry. And then it comes out in these kinds of activities. Again, the, most of the men who comprise the manosphere are men who have not been able to find a partner. And that's, it's kind of fuels their, their, um, this kind of activity. Another really interesting thing is that there's some evidence that this is the kind of behavior that also fuels uh, authoritarian regimes. There's some I've read some stuff that says that like when Hitler came to power, the same it was a similar dynamic that men were feeling quote emasculated, and they so authoritarianism is fueled by this sense sense of frustration that men have when they're less able to control women. It certainly seems to be true in this country. A lot of the men who voted for Trump, were, it's a similar kind of thing. They realized that sexism is a key part of that, what fueled that election. So I do think that that, that is a key part in, in animating this, move, this kind of behaviors. Well, we don't really have to, to go the direction I'm going to ask, but, but it does make me think about it, that also um, authoritarianism often rises when there has been economic hardship and in addition there's a, f- a feminist friend of mine, a female friend of mine was just saying to me the other day that that well, we all know this anyway, that when the mill closes, rates of domestic violence go up right. and and so it's there's an interesting, there's an, another layer too um, that that and also another thing that goes up when economic when when there are economic collapses is uh, there's a rise of of overt racism. You know the KKK got really big in the 20s, just like in the Weimar Republic. You know there was there was this increasing anti-Semitism. Um, economic collapse leads to all sorts of um, hatreds that way. Right. So I think that that's part of what toxic masculinity is about is about a sense of entitlement to things, and when there's, you know, jobs are less or, uh, you know, like uh, they're less available to get resources, either women or jobs or whatever uh, traditional men want, then they're angry and embittered and then they turn that against other groups. Is that, is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah, 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 except you said it much better. Um, <laughs> so the, the, the next question is, um, is this, are these, are these, uh, this, this harassment and these rape and death threats, are these primary, uh, primarily a tool of the far right, or is there a lot of harassment from the left as well in your perspective? I mean, I think it's very predominant among, among the right, but I do think that it has happened among the left, among men on the left, with when it comes to the whole transgender and gender-critical uh, women, feminists who are advocating gender-critical ideology. I think that's a place where men on the left have definitely taken up the rape and death threats in full force. And that that strikes me as really interesting too. That you know the left is supposed to. I mean, we have this sort of generic idea that the left is somehow less misogynist than the right, but it seems like uh, it could be simply a different different flavor. Yes, I think the problem with some of the left is, and I think you've said this in some things before, is it's informed by some pretty bankrupt values of postmodernism. And you combine that with uh, neoliberal kind of uh, economic values and how that plays out in social and uh, cultural values as well. And I think those things inform the left in ways that the left hasn't dealt with. For example, one prominent value of neoliberalism is hyper-individualism. And... And also postmodernism tends to um, collapse or, or atomize people um, and act like you can never, there's no such thing as social classes or social groups. You can never make generalizations. Um, so it, it uh, obliterates class analysis in a way. So those kinds of ideas have infected the left to the point where I think when those ideas come in, women's uh, rights and women's values and, or women's issues become obliterated in the view of people adopting those ideas. So that I do think the left has some some of those ideologies that allows it to 
to say, you know, for example, one of my, you know, uh, if you get too focused on, one of my things is that if you get too focused on gay rights as opposed to women's rights and all, about diversity and everybody can be however they want, that's very hyper individualistic. And then you can't see the structural things that keep all kinds of people down, gay people included. But especially women's issues become invisibilized when you focus only on individual agency and individual choice. So I think those are kind of the values that inform some of the virulent sexism on the left. And I find it really, and I'm sorry to use an academic word, but I find it really interesting as well as horrifying, don't worry, that um, that the, the, the workhorse that's brought out when when a woman, when a man disagrees with a woman, is the same on the left or the right in that there are still the threats of violence. Yes. There's still the, the threats of rape as opposed to going, you know what, I just disagree with you. I think your opinion is incorrect. And here's why I think your opinion is incorrect. Instead, you know, the lefties who are supposed to be all about tolerance and everything else go, well, okay, so you said that, so now I'm going to find out where you live and I'm going to come and kill you. And it's just, the, right. it's, the, it's the same old patriarchal workhorse that gets brought out. Absolutely, and the deplatforming and the shutting shutting women out of social media. I mean, it's it's shocking, and of course, and it's interesting too how many men are now working in social media and Facebook and Twitter, and how many kind of geeky these kind of men who believe in these values they're now silencing women on social media, which is really bad. But yeah, it's, it's, and of course this is happening in universities where they're shutting down people's speech, uh, women on the left, uh, women, feminist women are being shut down. And it's, it's ironic that they can't see it at all, that they claim to be for free speech, but it's a very curious thing, really, that, that it could be, that it's so hypocritical and yet people don't see it that way. And this is not, again, this is not just feminist opinions. This happened, as you said, when Ashley Judd dared to express an opinion about a basketball game. Right, right. So it definitely happens across all kinds of women's opinions. Um, but feminist women, I think, are, pro are targeted a bit more, for sure, um, at least according to the women I've interviewed and the women that I whose stories I've featured in my book. Um, feminist women definitely bear the brunt of it. Just, I did want to mention a couple other things that also happen in addition to what I've defined as gender trolling um, on the Internet. Obviously, we all know about revenge pornography, um, which is also called non-consensual pornography. There's another, there's another, some other things that are starting to happen, which I think are important to understand because the Internet is a tool that can be used in ways that really harms women, and we haven't kind of created uh, any kind of laws or abilities to fight them. And one is a, a kind of an up-and-coming one is called rape by proxy, where often a woman's ex-husband or ex-boyfriend will put an ad supposedly in her name on Craigslist or on a dating site or some other forum and telling men that, she, that like, as, as if he's that woman, saying, I, liked for, I, like rough, rough, I like rough sex, come to my house, here's my address, and if I pretend to not want it, I really do, come, basically come rape me. And women have had that happen to them, and hordes of men just in another house day and night. That is a that's a thing that's been happening more and more. Another one is uh, this is happening a lot in India, but increasingly in other countries where a woman is raped or gang raped, and the rapist or rapists film her rape and then threaten to put it on the internet if she tells anyone. So there are specific ways in which the internet is being used to to target women. <laughs> And again, these are also bleed into real life. So I want to to put a put a big asterisk or put a big mark or something on what you just said about. Okay, first off, any 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 man who would would do that to, I mean, who would who would put that ad in to call the the other men over. I mean that 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 needs to he needs to be in prison for the rest of his life just or something he needs to be removed from society. Second, I just want to to, to highlight that you just said hordes of men would descend on the house and yeah. that I'm gobsmacked. I mean that, that I I if I I don't yeah I don't understand how 
I mean, I've written 25 books about about the horrors of this culture, and I still can't wrap my mind around what you just said. Yeah, right. It's just how how even one man's doing it, let alone so many, is, and it just speaks to the the position of women, the way men, so many men regard women. And it's it's. I mean, the fact that all this is happening on the the fact that these men's rights activists congregate in these areas in the manosphere and there's thousands of men in there egging each other on and talking about how women have all the power in society and rape is a myth and it's just it's it's all that's gobsmacking too it's it's incredible that things that they believe and the things they tell themselves so this is way too early to ask this because we still have like 13, 14, 15 minutes left and this is kind of a wind down question so please don't wind down with this okay <laughs> but what this is just horrifying what do we do okay so I mean one thing is like all feminist issues the first thing is to just raise awareness about it it's really important for women to know this goes on this is not unusual so as each woman to whom it happens they're not like oh my god what did I do and to kind of create some kind of solidarity about it consciousness raising support for each other there's some other things, again, raising consciousness about it in the larger mainstream world. We need to, just like with domestic violence, like with date rape, like with rape, all these things, we need to do the kind of do the legwork that had to happen with those uh, areas. Not that that's done, but uh, in terms of enforcing existing laws, I, I am a particular advocate of enforcing credible death and rape threats on the Internet. They're basically not enforced at all now, and they're not even taken seriously. But law enforcement needs to take them seriously, and I do think that if it did, it would have a quelling effect, a silencing effect on men across the Internet. Once they got the clue that some men were being jailed for making credible rape and death threats, I think it would have an effect, a chilling effect. That's the word I'm looking for. Also, so that what goes in hand in hand with that is law enforcement needs to be trained just like it had to be trained with regard to Domestic violence, you know, it used to be just considered a private problem. And they would just kind of talk to the guy and say, hey, chill out and send it back home. So law enforcement needs to be educated. Protocols need to be changed. But also we need to realize that these things are going on and there need to be new laws created and old laws amended to take into account that these things are happening. Because right now women are defenseless because these things are happening and there's no legal structure that can counter it. So that would be the three things I would say needs to happen is enforcing existing laws, amending and making new laws, and training law enforcement, in addition to consciousness raising. But, yeah. So can you – we you talked a little bit about historical silencing of women, and then we've talked about online harassment as a way to silence women – and does this online harassment, you know, you've mentioned deplatforming, and I've talked to so many women who have been afraid to speak out, not just about the lefty issues, but afraid to speak out in general about anything for fear of losing their jobs. So can you, can you, I mean, you did a wonderful job of talking a little bit about the history. Can you can you put this in the context of, of modern silencing of women as well? So, yeah, I do think that, I mean, women, for one thing that's happened is that a lot of these uh, men from the manosphere will contact women's workplaces or will put out pornography about them and send it to all their contacts, including their uh, supervisors and family and friends. Um, so that can certainly affect their jobs. Um, the other arena of course, that's been happening lately, and not, you know, we would be remiss not to discuss it, is um, what's happened with Megan Murphy and with the uh, gender trender uh, author who's been shut out of uh, WordPress. So women who speak out on the transgender issue are also um, shut down, and this is an example of that on the left, where um, they can, women can lose their jobs for, for, that, for having any kind of opinions on that topic, which is a really important topic for women's rights, and it's not even being able, allowed to be discussed at this point. I'm so I, I I agree with you that laws need to be changed, and 
You know, I, I want to come back to the credible death threat uh, 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 for, for just a second. That several years ago, I was discovered by the sort of Glenn Beck crowd, and oh. I, I received a whole bunch of death threats, and some of them were, as you said, very detailed. And they would have my schedule, um, they would have my address, and then there would be pictures of people being castrated, and they would say, this is what we're going to do to you. And I went to the cops. I went to the cops basically for one reason, which is that I started, honestly, I started carrying a gun around. And mm-hmm. I um, I wanted, if somebody did attack me, I wanted it a matter of public record that I was afraid. And if I used force to defend myself, I could just see a trial playing out where they would say, so were you afraid? i say, yes. They say, did you call the cops? And I'd say, uh, no. And it's like, they say, you weren't very afraid then, were you? Trial's over, I lose. So I called the cops, but I didn't expect them to do anything, and they didn't. And I even had a friend of mine who knows computers much better than I was able to trace some of the IPs and able to locate, actually identify a few of the people. And I handed that all to the cops, and they just stared at me. And the, the, the guy, one of the guys who was doing it, I live in California, he was in Massachusetts. And the cops are like, look, he's in Massachusetts, he's not going to do anything to you. And I'm not complaining so much about the cops, it's just how, it's like, how, I, I, take this wherever you want. It's just, it, it just, it ends up being just this morass because you have, you know, some guy in, is it a credible, don't worry, I'm not undercutting the importance of the threats. I was terrified. I was carrying a gun around. And at the same time, the cops could easily say, look, this is a person in Tampa, Florida, and you live in California, so what do you care? So a couple things. One is those those threats, if, if your information is out on the Internet, someone in Tampa, Florida may be making that threat, but someone else may be seeing it who lives near you. And that so that can happen. Um, the other thing is that um, credible threats uh, – oh, the problem with the police also is that they don't understand, like you say, the IP addresses. They're not trained in understanding much about – a lot of police officers don't use the Internet a lot. Some do, but some don't. And so they're handed IP addresses, and they're like, what is that? Like I've, I, one woman handed them some IP addresses, and it, he thought they, they were phone numbers. I mean, he did not know what they were about or that you can get IP addresses. Or So there's a lot of you know educational a- aspects as far as that's concerned. But I do think it's really important for I, – I do think police are way too cavalier because of the way – the internet works in the sense that somebody, like you, like I said, can make a threat in Tampa, Florida, but there may be someone who lives near you who could be part of some forum and then take them up on that. So, really, I guess what I'm hearing you say is that society in general needs to take the threats against women more seriously, and it also needs to um, recognize the larger pattern that these are not, as we were just saying, this is not just one individual, but instead this is a larger, a larger campaign of political terror against women. Yes, and I, I think the other thing, one of the other things I argue in my book is that we need to see through some of the kind of what I call them um, cultural defense mechanisms, because there's these ways in which. And I think this is something that happens whenever there's abuse of power, both either personally or in a larger uh, systemic way, where there's ways in which what women say or what the oppressed group says are disregarded. So one of them is the, you know, the reverse thing where the very people who are threatening to kill or rape or, you know, harm, bodily harm people are saying, well, that's my free speech. So it's kind of a reverse, uh, the blaming, it's like a reverse, the, I think you call it DARVO, isn't it? Yeah, it's DARVO, exactly. DARVO, deny, which is, yeah. Yeah, deny, attack, reverse, reverse victim, victim, and offender. Offender, right, exactly. Obviously there's blaming the victim, they're shooting the messenger, so often they're, the person who's saying this, the problem is pilloried as having some terrible, you know, qualities. There's, uh, people suddenly feel sorry for the, for the offender. Um, obviously, that happens in many rape cases. Um, the, then, again, the perpetrator is a real victim. So there's all these ways in which we kind of – what's happening to women has become invisibilized because because these techniques are employed to make the perpetrators seem, you know, like they're not the bad guys. So I think that's another thing I'd like to raise awareness about is so we can kind of see clearly 
some of these very people who are claiming free speech are the very ones who are shutting down free speech. And I, you know, if you've ever, you know, been around abusive people, they do that exact thing. They accuse you of doing what they're doing. Um, so that's that. I think that confuses a lot of mainstream people. And I wish people were more kind of savvy about that kind of uh, technique or strategy for silencing uh, victims' voices. So I'm gonna I'm gonna ask a question here, and I'm not in any way meaning to diminish these threats because. Again, I've experienced it myself, and, and they have been terrifying to me. But what do you say to people? I know you've answered this, but I just want to hammer it. That um, What do you say to people who go, oh, that's just the Internet, that's just some dude blowing off steam? Well, one thing I would say is the two incels who recently shot people were both on incel forums, both uh, Elliot Roger and Alex Minassian uh, were on the, the similar forums where they were kind of egged on for, you know, their their grievances nursed. So, so it, these they these things that are said on the internet affect people. They affect a lot of people. And I think you touched on it earlier about how there's a class of a group of men who are don't feel that they're getting what they deserve. So they're right for having their grievances fomented. So these kinds of um. And that's an important thing. On the other hand, of course, I'm I'm very strongly in favor of free speech, so it's hard to say no one should be able to say these things online. But that's why I draw a hard line about credible, even not so credible, threats of violence and rape or bodily harm. You can, you can say men are you know victims, women are have all the power. That I believe that that people ought to be able to say that, but you cannot threaten people. So that they're in fear for their life or for their bodily integrity. That is where that's how you shut down speech in, in other people. So, and that's really where I'd like to end. Is can can you talk for just a minute or two about? And you've said this, but can you just bring it home? The effects of. I know so many women who have said, "I so want to talk about." Oh, like I have a friend who does wonderful work, and I asked her if I could interview her, and she said. Um, can you wait a year until I retire because right now I can't tell the truth. Yeah. And I, I can't tell you how many women I've talked to who have said something along those lines. Yeah, I, I actually, I don't know what to say about that because that is the reality right now. Um, it's, um, I think you, you know, you saw that, uh, a lot of people saw that video of that, um, uh, this tangentially related, but that uh, trans-identified male who was yelling at a clerk in a some kind of a store, but he was saying that, you know, I'm a woman, I'm a woman, and the clerk was terrified to lose his job. Um, so that's, it's just, there's a hegemony right now where certain things you cannot say or you'll lose your job. And I, that's a that's a tough one. The only thing I can think about that is the more people that come out, the more women that come out and speak things that, the better we'll we'll be able to fight that, but that's we're in a bad position as far as that is concerned right now. So the I guess my last question, and thank you so much for everything you've said. My last question is: you talked about what what we can do in terms of laws, and there's also raising awareness. And what 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 would you like to say to women who are themselves receiving these this online harassment? What would you like to say to them? So I think what would be important to say to women who are receiving this is you're not alone. This is not happening to you from anything you've done in particular. I mean, women. Ha I, one woman who was a food blogger got viciously attacked. Um, it, it can be anything. So that's really important to know. Another thing that is important to know is most of these rape and death threats do not come to fruition. They're made liberally. So as scary as they are, the odds are you won't actually be harmed. However, that said, you, you know, you need to take care of yourself and kind of assess them as best you can. And to connect with other women, there are sites where people, women talk about what they've done, how to kind of, how to remedy things, how to, um, there are certain legal things you can do. There's such thing as, uh, take down notices. There are some, few legal remedies, so try to investigate what, what of those can be done. Um, but just, I think, knowing you're not alone and that the, probably you're going to be okay 
is helpful because a lot of women have been through this. And I don't, knock on wood, I don't know yet of any deaths from this. That doesn't mean that there will be one tomorrow. So that's not very encouraging, but but uh, the, the odds are in their, your favor is what I would say. Well, thank you so much for raising this incredibly important issue, and thank you for all of your work, and I would like to thank listeners for listening. My guest today has been Carla Mantia. This is Derek Jensen for Ristosant Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. <laughs>